from Deloitte Tax. Welcome to the Tax News and Views podcast. In this podcast series, we talk to specialists from Deloitte about the business issues and developments that are impacting them. I'm Carrie Falkenhayn, your host for Tax News and Views. And today's topic is on the most recent developments related to the OECD tax framework that could have major implications for multinational corporations around the world. Specifically, on December 20th, 2021, the OECD Inclusive Framework on BEPS published some documents on Pillar 2 that we're going to share more information with you all today. To discuss these rules, I have two special guests rejoining me today, Allison Loeb and Bob Stack. Allison leads Deloitte's efforts with respect to the OECD, and Bob is the former Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Tax Affairs for the U.S. Treasury. And to get us started, Allison, I'll I'll go to you. And there were two important documents that were released, as I mentioned. What are these documents and why are they important? Thank you very much, Carrie. So the first document that came out on the 20th of December came from the OECD Inclusive Framework, so more than 135 countries that participate in that OECD network, and relates to model rules for a global minimum tax. You may recall that there was political agreement for this global minimum tax back in October of 2021, but what we didn't have was any details of how the rules would operate. And that first document, 70 pages of model rules on how a global minimum tax would be applied. Shortly after that, so two days later, we got a second document, which was the European Union's version of how to implement those OECD rules. So not changing the content per se, but making those model rules something that could be implemented in the EU member states. And together, this marked the first time that we'd seen the detail of the legislation of how governments saw this global minimum tax working. And of course, it's given businesses um, some time to look at what they're going to need to do and potentially also what it's going to mean for them. So could you give us a high level reminder of what was included in Pillar 2 and what the rules set out to do? Yes. So the Pillar 2 rules are really around ensuring that businesses pay a minimum level of tax on their profits in every country where they operate. So sometimes it's called the global minimum tax perspective. And the political agreement agreed last year was that the global minimum rate would be set at 15%. And the model rules that we received from the OECD set out that there's two interlocking rules that will achieve these for most businesses. The first is called the income inclusion rule and applies from a a parent company downwards to tax and top up any tax that hasn't been paid on uh, low tax profits. And then there's a backstop rule, which applies if the income inclusion rule hasn't been applied. That's the undertax profits rule. It's changed its name from the undertax payments rule to the undertax profits rule. And that applies in situations where the parent company jurisdiction has not applied an income inclusion rule. Now, the rules are quite complicated. They rely a lot on accounting information to try and establish a consistent global tax base. The OECD has looked to financial accounting information as being uh, the basis um, for much of the new rules. That's then compared um, with taxes paid in countries, so actual taxes paid. But by necessity, in order to come up with something that works for as many countries as possible and as as consistent as possible, there's a number of difficult areas to deal with. One of those being around timing differences, where the OECD has chosen to look at a modified deferred tax basis for dealing with smoothing of variations between financial accounting information and tax payments for all countries. So the whole idea is around establishing a global minimum tax. Why are these rules relevant for U.S. multinationals, Bob? Maybe you could talk about that. U.S. multinationals will say, well, we already have a minimum tax in the U.S. It's called the guilty. The global minimum tax that Allison talked about will apply to companies over 750 million euros of revenue, whereas the U.S. rules apply to U.S. multinationals that own CFCs all around the world, and those are our guilty rules. Now, folks may recall 
that when the Biden administration came into office, it wanted to raise the U.S. guilty rate from the current 10 and a half, 13 and an eighth, all the way up to 21 percent. The most recent proposals in the House are around uh, 15 percent. Well, in order to get Congress to agree to raise our guilty rate, it was important for the Biden administration to kind of convince the rest of the world that it, too, should have some type of a min tax so that U.S. businesses were playing on a level playing field. But of course, now, as we all know, if you're following the news, it's not 100 percent certain at all that the U.S. Congress will increase the guilty rate up to 15 and or put our guilty to be on a country by country basis. And so U.S. multinationals are looking at two scenarios. In one scenario, Congress agrees to raise the guilty rate and do it on a country by country basis. In that case, the U.S. multinationals generally would not be subject to that under tax profits rule that Allison represented with respect to its affiliates around the world, but it would still be impacted by the under tax profits rule with respect to any low tax profits in the U.S. as determined under those global rules. So even if Congress acts, U.S. multinationals can still be subject to part of these rules. On the other hand, if Congress does not act to raise the guilty rate up to 15 and do it on a country by country basis, then U.S. multinationals would have their affiliates around the world, their low tax affiliates around the world, subject to under tax profits rules such that other jurisdictions will get to top up the tax for those low tax affiliates of U.S. multinationals. And in addition, the U.S., the foreign countries could tax low tax profits in the United States. Now, one thing to be aware of here is we also expect, whether the U.S. acts or not, that many countries around the world might just raise their domestic corporate rate up to 15 so that there'd be no further top-up tax either under an income inclusion rule or an under-tax profits rule. And that's just something companies are going to want to be aware of as they look around at their global work structure. So lots of impact on the U.S. businesses and a lot of the steps that Congress takes here in the weeks and months ahead. What are U.S. companies doing to prepare for these rules? Well, I think, first of all, there's a lot of uncertainty because they're not sure which direction Congress is going to go, number one. But number two, one of the things that companies need to start thinking about is looking at their tax profile with respect to their U.S. operations and perhaps their non-U.S. operations. Now, we didn't get into all this detail, but we're talking about whether or not an affiliate pays an effective tax rate of 15% or more. And these pillar two rules that Allison referenced actually apply not tax rules, not book rules, but a sort of blend of book and tax rules, both for determining what taxes go into the numerator of determining your effective tax rate and how to calculate the income that goes into the denominator. And this is all done on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis. I think the most concern, because as I mentioned earlier, that is that U.S. multinationals, whether we increase our guilty rate or not, could be subject to these rules with respect to their U.S. income. And so first and foremost, they're asking themselves, could my U.S. operations be viewed to have an effective rate of less than 15 percent under these rules? And what might be some of the things that would cause their U.S. effective rate under these rules to be different from what, how they calculated for book or how they might think of it from a pure tax perspective? Well, there are special rules on how do you treat different types of tax credits, for example, in addition to a variety of other rules around the treatment of deferred tax assets and liabilities. So they need to dig into those special rules and ask, how does that impact the calculation of my U.S. only ETR, if you will? Got it. Allison, what are we seeing with European or other companies outside the U.S.? What are they doing to prepare? Yes, in some ways, it's a little bit easier for European and other companies because it's expected that the rules would apply to them and they don't have the same uncertainty over, say, the guilty regime. So they are doing a number of things to prepare. Firstly, they are assessing where they might have 
uh, low tax profits and where there might be potentially additional top up tax to pay. Secondly, they are looking at, in particular, the data that they will need to get in order to be able to comply with these rules. And that data will come from a number of different sources, including financial accounting information from tax returns and and other tax sources, and also potentially will have to be created. And finally, as well, for European and other companies, they've got one eye on the fact that at some point in the future, they will need to comply with the rules in terms of preparing uh, what's called a globe income return to assess how much top up tax they should pay and also be in a position to file that return with tax authorities. And so they have uh, one eye to the future that they will need to be in a position to do that at the end of this process. There's a lot of things for companies to consider. Bob, what are the next steps in relationship to this project? When are these things going to be effective? The OECD political agreement, the Inclusive Framework political agreement, called for these rules to be effective, the income inclusion rule, 2023, and the under-tax profits rule in 2024. And to that end, the Inclusive Framework is going to put out commentaries, probably in the month of February, to kind of supplement the rules that they put out in December so that people have a little more detail and discussion of, and understanding, maybe some examples, et cetera, of how the rules apply. And then also during 2022, they will develop what's called an implementation framework that will focus on the administration, compliance, and coordination issues. Allison was already mentioned, mentioning filing of returns around the world. And so there's an awful lot of detail that needs to be brought together during 2022 so that this can go into effect in 2023 with countries around the world. As Allison mentioned, the day after the OECD acted, the EU put out a proposed directive, and it would also be effective on the income inclusion rule in starting in 2023 with the under tax profits rule there, 2024. And so in that sense, the EU is kind of the first out of the gate, although the UK also put out a consultation document within the last couple of weeks where they're going to move on a very similar schedule as well. Then coming back to the US, our guilty changes, if enacted, are also set to go into effect in uh, 2023. So a lot happening next year to get ready, with the goal being to have this implemented in 2023. Certainly sounds like there's a lot to do, a lot more guidance needed, but then a lot of data gathering and analysis that companies would need to do to be able to comply. So I'm sure we'll be hearing more from the two of you uh, as additional rules come out. Thank you again for being part of this webcast. uh, And I look forward to reconnecting once we have additional developments. If our listeners would like more information, you can download the Tax at Hand app and search that. You'll find a number of postings that includes these topics. You can also connect with Allison or Bob directly via LinkedIn or tune in here for future policy editions. In the meantime, thank you again for joining in and I hope you all continue to be well. 